Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Osborne. I'm a marketing specialist with the ADECO Group, which is the parent company of Agilon. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our webinar today, the Supply Chain and Logistics, a Field for Trailblazers. Uh, it's being presented by Agilon and the University of Washington's Supply Chain, Transportation, and Logistics Master's Program. We're happy to have everyone um, today what should be a very informative webinar about an ever-evolving, very dynamic sector of the economy that shows great opportunity for both job seekers and companies uh, that literally knits the global economy together. So if you have any issues, you should be able to raise your hand, look at the bottom left of your screen, or there's a chat button. Um, that will alert me or the rest of the presenters to your issues, and we will try to resolve them as quickly as possible so your presentation will be seamless. I'm now going to jump into our presentation for today. A little background about Agilon. Uh, it is one of the largest professional staffing firms in the country, and along with its sister brands of accounting principals, Parker and & Lynch, and Paladin, uh, we we staff various niches and economic sectors. Some of the verticals that Agilon services are general administrative staffing, human resources, non-clinical health care, and of course our fastest growing niche, supply chain and logistics. And we serve over 70 markets nationwide, and that is growing. And we welcome all people from every market, particularly the Seattle market today. Introduce the presenters. Uh, Linnell Flint will produce the meat of the presentation today. She is a regional VP out of the Seattle branch. Uh, Linnell has years of experience. She's been a VP since 2006, and she will provide many great insights into the state of the industry, where we are and where we're going, and the opportunities and challenges that face us today. Eden Murphy is a division director and executive recruiter out of the Seattle branch. And Eden uh, will kind of wrap us up today with some information regarding career development, uh, job search, that should speak to a lot of people who are considering the supply chain and logistics field and what's kind of the best means for them to break into it. And also want to welcome and thank uh, Bill Keogh of the University of Washington Master's Program. And Bill, I'm going to give you a moment to just speak about what the program's all about and uh, just kind of give us a little Cliff Notes version of what y'all do. Sure, that's great. Thanks a lot, Sam. Yeah, so uh, my name is Bill Keogh. I run the Supply Chain, Transportation, and Logistics Master's Program here, and I also teach several courses in the program. Uh, just very quickly, the program is designed for uh, supply chain and logistics professionals, usually in the early part of their career, who are seeking to advance to more senior and ultimately executive roles. The program tries to help um, our students understand the end-to-end -end supply chain and the impact that decisions decisions in inventory or transportation might have all the way up and down the, uh, the supply chain. Uh, the, with the exception of a residency on campus here at UW, the program is entirely online with live classes for two hours uh, once a week, and you'll work through the program with, your, uh, with one particular cohort. So um, if you're interested, uh, our final deadline is May 1st. Uh, to apply, so you can go to our website uh, and see more if you'd like. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, thank you, Bill. That was a great introduction, and we want to thank Bill and his team for their help in uh, getting this presentation together. And now I'm going to turn it over to Linnell, dispense with the formalities. Uh, Linnell, take it away. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Bill. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for attending. It is definitely an honor to me um, to be partnering with the University of Washington and being asked to speak today on this project. We certainly hope you'll find some helpful takeaways for today's presentation and um, definitely want to provide you with some tools and, and individuals, folks from the local area to reach out to if you want additional information such as the master's program Bill spoke about or our services um, in the future. So uh, right off the bat, our key areas of focus for today are going to be these top six, I'd say. Um, how technology analytics um, are kind of 
not not just running uh, the supply chain world right now, but how it's going to explode um, over the next 10 to 15 years and be something that we really need to pay attention to. I um, want you guys to know if you're in the position to find a role and what you're looking for in your next opportunity, that industry and company size do count in this sector of the world. Um, good thing, good news is that millennials and women are making a move here. That's exciting for a lot of um, a lot of the folks that are in the UW program, but just women across the country. Um, what jobs we want you guys to, to look at to target because they're the fastest growing in the sector. How to break in to those jobs or how to land your dream job really. And the most important thing, how to get paid well um, when you finally do land that. And so I will say um, right off the bat, let me open this and say I'm going to be speaking more on a national level at the beginning. The data and content we'll cover is being pulled from a couple of surveys that logistics uh, management associations and networking groups pulled together on a national basis. But we will um, get into the meat and potatoes of specific Seattle, Pacific Northwest area uh, companies to look that, that you should be targeting, positions you should be targeting, and salary ranges that you should be looking at. And so if, um, if we move to that area of looking at national information, the logistics management uh, organization that just ran their 33rd annual salary survey is going to give us our first points of data here. I'll say without question there are two topics currently dominating almost every conversation within logistics and transportation um, supply chain, and that is A, e-commerce, and the second is analytics, technology, but most specifically the analytics and how analytics are going to, in some people's minds, uh, revolutionize supply chain over the next you know, five to ten years. Um, right off the bat, we'll just start with the double-digit growth in e-commerce and why is that important? Why is that a hot topic of discussion? Um, when we're talking about finding your, your niche, finding where you want to land, and who's growing the quickest, the fastest, going to be um, positioned the strongest, e-commerce by hands down is showing the hottest um, growth. And because each, it, because e-commerce, uh, the industry is showing double-digit sales growth from four years um, up to now. We are in the field of supply chain and logistics and transportation scrambling to keep up with the client's demands for, of course, a more quick, quick and efficient um, opportunity or way to get our products, their products out. So 66% or, and, and actually before I go there, let me just say that it, that is not the only sector or the only industry that's hiring at a, at a, a large scale scope right now. Um, secondary would be specialized distribution and materials movement companies. I'm talking about old school companies that do freight forwarding that are all in the world of distribution and, and movement of product um, like XPO Logistics and um, you know, DHL or UPS. That is still right up there right next to e-commerce. Um, the hot industry and hiring the most um, staff, but it does vary from uh, you know very entry level driver type of um, staff members up to senior and executive level. Third are going to be specific air cargo companies. They're making a move over the last two years because of our consumers' need for speed. Uh, it does offer usually a quicker delivery time to um, the consumer, and so it is outpacing the growth of the land cargo movement um, organizations. And then surprising to me, maybe not to you guys, um, but the healthcare uh, industry is, is trying to and pushing for better supply chain management efficiencies, specifically due to healthcare um, regulations. It's, we're talking about the, the industry needing more product tracking, traceability, um, faster delivery, but specifically because of um, the Affordable Care Act and strong regulations that are being put out there, it, it's allowing for more efficiencies and compliance on healthcare companies' parts if they improve their supply chain management process. So that's a big um, push we've seen very, very in the, in the recent future. And then the standard good old um, manufacturing world. They'll always be a key player in this world and needing staff. Um, again, kind of like uh, the specialized distribution materials companies that uh, from entry level all the way to senior level positions. That second topic I was talking about of analytics um, is 
uh, 66% of supply chain leaders say that advanced supply chain analytics are critically important to their supply chain operations in the next two, two, two to three years. But the other stat that I didn't list here is that only 5% of those respondents said that they were ready or had a great plan in place um, to ensure that they were going to be along the, the lines of having a, a great analytics and tracking system, a technology system to allow them to um, improve their analytics system. Areas specifically seeing the greatest growth in the analytics, specifically supply chain analytics, are the need for improving forecast accuracy. Obviously, this comes into play with weather um, and um, you know any potential, um, I guess, weather specific uh, problems that could could hold materials back. Um, optimizing transportation performance, knowing when your trucks are ready to to be to be retired out, and when you need, need new products when you have uh, drivers, when you need new drivers, um, improving product tracking and traceability, and then of course analyzing product returns. So those are the two topics that are hot on every, every leader that we talk to, every blog I read, uh, every, every um, webinar that I've attended like this. Those are the two hot topics out there. And I would say if you don't have experience exposure in e-commerce or you, if you're not looking at that as a potential place for you to go, or you don't have a hold on um, how to get into analysis and analytics, it's something I would, would certainly recommend. So if we go into their actual um, survey stats compensation-wise, you will see on a national basis that 2017, 20, it, we give you the data from 2013 up to 2017, median salaries for managers held steady at 90K. There really wasn't any much movement. It was maybe 8.8, .8, um, or excuse me, it was actually 9% in 2016, but 8.8 .8 in 2017. Um, the pay of managers with three to five years experience rose from 87 to 97 from 2016 to 2017, and that was pretty exciting to see that with uh, very little uh, extra couple of years on your, your resume and in your background, you could jump up a good 10K in salary. Logistics managers with e-commerce experience remained the highest paid out there at 105. Again, just kind of giving credence and credibility to what we were talking about um, that this industry uh, or that sector of the world is going to play a big part in supply chain. And then in Oddly, uh, boomer retirement, the growth of e-commerce and the demand for technology proficient employees means, of course, younger workers are going to be better positioned for advancement, and they tend to be more comfortable with digitized, digitized commerce. Um, so there's going to be a, a definite switch or a ripple effect in the salary because as younger players come in and older players go out, um, those, salaries, those median salaries actually might dip a little bit, but it's due to the dynamic of the age of the workforce here. Um, specifically, if we're talking about gender, we did discuss how um, at the beginning there women are starting to make a move here. More women are likely to be involved with import and export um, operations. You know, historically speaking, this sector has been dominated by male employees. And now new factors are encouraging women to, to, to develop their careers here. And their need for, let's say, excessive manual labor has dropped. Um, the need for analytics and tech uh, specific developments has increased, and women have felt like they have a stronger uh, technical background or their skill set is more proven to, to work in this field now. They feel like the functions of their job um, have increased over the past two to three years because of those two areas and, and how manual labor is not as critical anymore. More women um, than men are planning to take uh, continuing education programs and want to have a higher end degree such as a master's and special certification. A greater role of women believe that there are advancement opportunities here. They do see a change, a big shift in being able to be leaders and executives in, um, in the industry. And they are more likely to find job fairs, trade media, social media helpful in learning more about opportunities um, than the male force, which is usually it's a who do you know sort of um, environment for most male folks in this field. Um, can't forget that millennials play a part here, younger um, individuals we just spoke about. But what's interesting here is that in the past year we surveyed, or they surveyed, excuse me, logistics management group um, surveyed, 
in the past year, has your salary level increased, stayed the same, or decreased? And the 7% that had um, decreased were in that, that area where it was maybe someone who needed three to seven years of experience, and baby boomers and those who had been in the, the world um, of, of manufacturing but had stayed in a certain role. Maybe they had not grown in title and career path. They had just stayed in the, the role they'd had for the last 15 years were starting to fall off and their salaries were a little bit higher. New millennials coming in taking a lower salary, it shows a decrease in an overall compensation. Um, I will say with millennials, if you're a hiring um, agent on this call, younger generations are demanding hel a healthier work-life balance. Money is not everything to them. A career with meaning, a job that has a positive societal impact, um, a really a job that allows a lot more flexibility than we've ever asked for or our, our staff and, and employees have ever asked for before is going to be a key indicator in whether you can draw and retain uh, millennials in the future. Um, really quick, I thought, <laughs> I thought this was a bit funny, um, that go, with, go West young man or woman, we have to put that in there for sure. It looks like the higher salaries out there are being um, holding strong and growing in that Midwest sector, Chicago sector, everywhere, um, which was surprising because usually it's the, you know, um, let's say Atlanta, um, New York, um, Boston areas that tend to have the higher, even over here in Seattle, have the higher salary ranges. But at this moment, the Midwest seems to have the most, uh, the highest demand for need, but also paying the best um, out there. And I already discussed the, the ripple effect in compensation. So those are national numbers that, um, you know, they're important if you're open to relocation. They're important just to keep up a, a pulse, get your finger on the pulse of, of what's happening in your world. But we wanted, excuse me, we wanted to provide you folks with some more specific Pacific Northwest and Seattle data. We're, privy, we're privileged to have uh, access to something called the supply, supply and demand portal system within CareerBuilder. And what we do is we can simply go in and put a geographical area, a title, um, an industry, and very little parameters, and it will spit out a whole bunch of data to us that allows us to see what are the top companies hiring in these titles, what is the median salary specific to set um, to Seattle, what does that trajectory look like, what's the trend from, those, um, from the, those salary numbers, what's the trend look like on job postings and how many people have been hiring. And so those are the graphs I'm going to share with you next. Because they're graphs and charts, they are sometimes a little difficult to read. This um, presentation is being recorded and will be able, you'll be able to have access to it so that you can go through it more slowly at your own leisure later, and or I will provide this entire deck to um, Bill Keogh if he wishes to share it, uh, any of these data points with you guys at, at, a, at a later date in a more specific in-depth um, way. But overall, if you run a supply and demand search within CareerBuilder in um, just the, t the overall arching topic of supply chain in Seattle, you will see that over the last eight months, we've had 484 total candidates who have put their resume on CareerBuilder. $72,000 is the local median compensation number compared to $70,000 across the nation, so we're a tad above that. But you'll see that there have been 8,096 job postings. Um, the flavor of the next few slides and the next part of our conversation is going to show how high in demand you guys are, how in demand the need for staff is, and how low the supply is. Um, now, top candidate titles. These are these are titles that we, that CareerBuilder pulled from the resumes of folks who are looking for a job. Out of the 484 candidates who posted their resumes starting to look for a job, the most um, popular title was supply chain analyst. Then uh, just any any job within supply chain that had senior as the title then Supply Chain Manager, Logistics Coordinator, and then Director of U.S. Market Supply. 
on the flip side of that, the top companies hiring out of those 8,096 job postings, not shocking, Amazon being number one, Starbucks is being number two, and that's kind of a newer thing um, as they have jumped on the bandwagon of, of e-commerce and distribution and um, trying to get their product out not just in store um, fashion, but needing a, a, a more efficient supply chain management system. Microsoft, XCO Logistics, as we mentioned earlier, and Nordstrom. And again, that's specifically just to, to the Seattle market. Um, the five most favorable locations by hiring indicator. What this means is this is in, in the client's mind the easiest place to find people. This is where there's the more supply than demand, and that's in Everett, Tacoma, Bellevue, Redmond, and Auburn. And then compensation by years of experience based on those 484 um, folks that were surveyed in this search, one to two years specifically in Seattle, one to two years you're looking at $52,000 in salary, three to five years is 55, six to 10 is 90, 11 to 15 is uh, 82, 16 to 20 is 100, and 21 plus years is 63K. Now we all had a conversation earlier yesterday, the folks on here that are presenting and part of our group, as to why that might be happening, that there's such a significant decrease um, in the, the 21 plus years area. Um, thoughts were maybe that folks were retiring and maybe they were working part time, maybe they were working as consultants and uh, doing things on a project and consulting based um, situation. Um, we had a lot of, of schools of thoughts as to why that was happening, but that is the data that came through specific to Seattle, so just interesting to note there. And then, my arrow stopped working, hang on one sec. All right. If we move on to, and, and again, I, I apologize for you know all the charts and graphs. That's so kind of hard to read. What's most important here is on the right hand side. Well, we'll go, but we'll go through all um, job titles that we just we just talked about. The job titles people are looking that are looking for um, positions posted the most are supply chain analysts, the senior supply chain manager, which is sixth coordinator. We discussed that. Those folks had 4% of them had high school degree, 3.6% uh, had associates, and then 48.8% of them had bachelors, and a strong number of those folks had master's degree. I would say that this is one of the industries where there is such a high percentage of individuals with a master's degree in this field. Um, it definitely certainly trumps like accounting. It even trumps IT, um, the, the IT sector by quite a bit. So that was interesting. But on the right-hand side, you'll see that candidates that are being um, posting their, their resumes, but also candidates that are being hired in the Seattle market are coming from the number one, University of Washington, Seattle campus. So woohoo there. Um, other schools that are that are pushing out really good candidates: Central Washington, University of Phoenix, Washington State University, and University of Florida. But UW holding the number one spot there. Um, compensation details here, based on a 30-mile radius that I ran. Um, the, the, again, it's showing a, a, me, a low and a median and a high. The low number is 55k. That median number 72. And then on the high end, it's um, 120, 123. Is that what that says? But if you look by location, the, the salaries do vary. We're assuming, we, we can only assume, that is because the types of companies that are in Bellevue, like a Microsoft, um, you could maybe even consider, uh, well, in Everett, you could consider Boeing and Fluke. And those folks are hiring a higher number volume-wise of senior managers, directors, and VPs, whereas in Seattle, there is a high number, quantity number, of entry-level mid-level um, staff and you know still a good number of, of senior managers and VPs, but they're outweighed by the quantity of entry-level workers. We, we are even talking about the picker packers and the warehouse folks that are at Amazon, which highly skew these numbers. Um, but that can tell you, that shows you right there, low, medium, and high based on where you live in the city, what kind of compensation you can expect to make. Um, this was something I thought interesting, so I kind of just threw it in there just to let you guys know as, as a closing remark here on the supply and demand portal system, how in demand you are. So the um, high 
um, bar here, the dark blue, is how many job postings are being uh, posted out there in the Seattle specific market. And this line down here, the smaller lower blue lines, are active candidates. So we have not had a very good influx at all of active candidates or available candidates coming on the market since May of 16 to 2018. And you'll see in about March of 2017, holding strong for quite some time, this great need for supply chain staff, and there is no change in the active candidates. That supply and demand is ex it's just extremely um, marked, and it means that you can be picky. It means that you can take your time in deciding who you want to go work for. It also means you can demand the right salary, the, the, the fair market value, but maybe even plus some um, that this industry and your skill set can demand right now because it is just there is a gap that needs to be filled, and companies are willing to, to do a little extra. They're going to have to do a little extra if they want to find the right staff out there. Um, the bottom line just shows active candidates year over year trend, um, February 2017 to January 18 versus 2016 to January 17. There's not a lot of change except for in May of 2016. There's a lot of factors here. I don't want to. I don't want to even assume as to where these these spikes are coming from. But again, on that top line, it's very obvious that there is going to be, has been and going to be a constant um, gap between how many candidates are available and how many clients need you. So just remember that. Be picky, be confident about yourselves, and take the time to really think about where you're going and the, the package you're being given um, to make sure it's fair. All right, so we'll end this with um, my portion and then I'll hand it off to my partner on how to find that dream job, and how to negotiate a really good salary. But I'm going to move into um, some really targeted salary information that Agilon, um, as, as Sam pointed out at the beginning, the Agilon brand, we're in about 70 um, different marketplaces across the 50 states, and we have specializations in HR, operations management, but we have a, a definitely a sector in supply chain that is growing faster than any of the other Others, um, that we any of our other niches and we are very blessed to be able to pull data from all those 70 locations to tell us um, what jobs are most in demand and what they're paying so specifically these are the top eight job requisitions that have been received by our Agilon recruiters over the last year and they are in um, order of how many, so the quantity of job requisitions that were brought in from high to low. And then I did add underneath the title the median salary specifically here in Seattle for that position. So first and foremost, purchasing agent was the highest um, number. I think it was probably 25 to 2,500 to 3,000 requisitions we've received. Purchasing agent can encompass, it, it really does mean a little bit more senior than, a, of course, a purchasing clerk or coordinator. It's, a, it's sometimes also seen or known as a broker. Um, it's, um, it's not a manager. It's not a purchasing manager. It's not a coordinator. It's right there in the middle. And the median salary in, in Seattle right now is 62 k an operations manager here was our second highest need and requisition, and that salary is around 116. Logistics analyst is the the one that we've seen the highest uh, number of or, or highest percentage of growth in job requisitions over the last two years. That salary is about 64,000. Supply chain manager 133. Purchasing manager 119. Logistics manager 124. Uh, production planning and expedition clerk or expediting clerk, these are going to be your very entry level right out of school positions. Um, if you didn't do internships, if you didn't um, have a mentor that helped you get actual uh, corporate live experience and you're just coming from school, you can expect to see about 49.5 or 50K in those areas. And then the highest paid position um, that we've been seeing re recently is the logistic, or excuse me, transportation manager at a salary of about 190. Again, these are Seattle-specific numbers. They vary um, greatly from location to location. I wanted to show this snapshot or screenshot of our um, Agilon 2018 Agilon sal Salary Survey. So you will see that this is just one page 
and it lists about, I think it's 16 positions on this page that um, are a, some sort of role within transportation logistics supply chain. It provides you with salary, base salary information. Um, it covers on what that salary should look like if you're working for a small, medium, or large um, company. And then it also shows total compensation options. Once you've got a base salary, then of course you can always negotiate and hope for bonuses or other stock options, um, other pieces of, of compensation that can bring you to a total comp number. And so it, it can show you um, what you should be making, what you could be making, and how to make sure you're within market um, value, you're, you're being fairly paid, and you can negotiate aggressively. We have this survey available to you both uh, electronically and in physical form. It's over 50 titles that we cover and can provide um, this information on. I've told Bill that we can um, get him the link right away so he can provide it to uh, any of his students. And like I said, we have a physical copy too. If you're not a student of Bill's with UW and you're just um, joining us as a as a client or someone um, you know, in the, in hoping to break into the industry, you can reach out to Eden. We'll have our contact information listed again at the end of this webinar here shortly um, that tells you how to reach us, and we can provide you with any of these tools, how, how to get into the Career Builder Supply and Demand, um, how to really search for good things on LinkedIn, how to find this salary survey. We are there at your disposal. So I'm going to turn you over um, to Eden. She only has a small bit in this presentation today, but it's an extremely important one. Eden has been um, recruiting in our market for 15 years, and her specialty has been within Agilon's operations management, uh, non-clinical health care and supply chain, and she is the, she's definitely the subject matter expert in how to find uh, your dream job and how to sal negotiate the salary properly. So I'm going to pass it over to her, Eden. Thank you, Linnell. Um, I appreciate You're the welcome. opportunity to talk to you all today. <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from those of you looking to land your dream job. Um, I'm going to steer my talking points here to our esteemed guests from the University of Washington Supply Chain, Transportation, and Logistics Master's Program. You are the future of the skill set, so I want to start here with some tips on what you can do to ultimately land your dream job, which is what we all aspire to do, right? Um, realistically, though, most of us don't really know exactly what that looks like, um, or even if we think we know when we finally get to that role, we're so focused on getting, it may not even be at all what we'd hoped it would be, um, but that's okay because it's very normal. Um, but what it can tell you is the effort that you put into finding the job will eventually get you there. Um, so with that being said, I have a few tips that I'd like to share um, that I hope will get you closer to landing your dream job. Uh, so first, um, do your research. You know, study the industry or field that you're looking to move into, um, and maybe determine like a couple companies that you'd like to work for. Um, you can find a lot of this information online on sites like Glassdoor or Yelp and just see what people are saying about these organizations. Um, you'll want to keep a pulse on which companies are posting the most roles. Um, you can do that by using Indeed.com and searching by title and a date range. Uh, LinkedIn, um, if it's not already, should be your best friend. Um, I'm hearing more and more from candidates that they are landing jobs through LinkedIn. Uh, so don't overlook the importance of how you look on that site. Uh, make sure your profile represents you well. Uh, you'll want to make sure your profile is up to date and that you have a professional photo. Um, I would highly recommend that you also set up job alerts um, so that you get access to the jobs as soon as they're posted. And then follow any companies or people that you're interested in working for. Um, you want to be seen on LinkedIn, but you also want to get a pulse on who's hiring. Another great website that I love is salary.com, um, which can provide you detailed information on local salaries and in-demand positions. Uh, company culture and overall fit is very important, so look into what diversity or inclusion initiatives they have, mentorship programs, flex hours, career growth, etc. Um, next, you know, learning from the experts without question, the art of networking is very strong within the supply chain um, industry. And many people are happy and willing to connect you with others, which you may have already experienced that. <laughs> so learn from the experts by reaching out to your network, um, reach out to your alumni group, your class mentors, and then definitely join a couple of supply chain logistics specific associations like APEX. Um, and a lot of those networking groups um, actually offer extended courses and certifications, which is a great plus. Um, don't discount the importance of soft skills. You know, technical and tangible skills are important, but what I am hearing from a lot of hiring managers specific to supply chain is that they want their employees to have strong communication skills, and they feel that they can train on technical skills. So 
if your communication and presentation, for example, are strengths for you, then you want to play those up because a lot of hiring managers may be willing to overlook some of the technical skills in exchange for um, strong soft skills. Um, but with that being said, I do want to say you've got to be confident and be ready to kind of play up your technical skills by developing a very strong idea of who you are and what you bring to the workplace. Um, think of very like, uh, specific skills that make, may set you apart from other candidates and then play those technical skills up at all times. Um, and don't look at your weaknesses as a negative thing. Um, really look at them as opportunities to improve and discuss how you are working on yourself to get better. Um, think about the leaders you admire and respect, especially if you want to lead yourself. Then think about how a leader acts, looks, walks, talks, and of course, above all, how they think. Um, flexibility, trainability, business leaders want to invest in their employees and are interested in job seekers who are flexible and adaptable during change, um, as well as those who are trainable. So specifically here, being open to change, having the ability to multitask, and just not being thrown off by change are key. Um, we're in a very progressive market and you know, companies are constantly changing, so super important. Um, knowing your worth is, is a very important part of this process. You're going to hear this a couple times. Um, as discussed at length during today's call, there's a ton of data at your fingertips to ensure you're getting paid fair market value and above. So make sure you study up on market averages for your role and that you are comfortable with your salary ahead of accepting a job offer. Um, don't panic sell your, and sell yourself short because remember, you are in demand and supply is low. Um, last but not least is leave an impression. Be bold in your plan to networking. Go talk to the people who have experiences you're seeking. Um, during an interview, arrive with questions prepared. I always tell my candidates, come prepared with three to four questions. Um, make it known that you want this job and that you can arise to any challenge. Dress to impress, but don't go over the top. Um, see if you can get a feel for what the company's dress code is ahead of time. Um, but you know, rule of thumb, what I always advise my candidates to do is just dress professional, but wear whatever makes them feel most confident. Uh, do your research. Again, LinkedIn, your best friend. Look up leaders and maybe peers that you'll be working with. Get to know their backgrounds. Um, see if you have similarities that you can touch on. Um, and always, always, follow up with a thank you. This goes a long way. Uh, it's another opportunity for you to express your interest in the opportunity, but also a chance to show off your communication skills. So um, now that we've gotten to the offer stage, um, we are going to talk about um, kind of what, you know, talk about what this probably the scariest part of landing your dream job is, which is salary negotiations. Nobody likes those. Um, so first off, salary negotiations should always be done um, in a live conversation, either over the phone or in person. Um, in person, you know, is, is ideal, but most, most realistic is probably going to be over the phone. Um, negotiating salaries make most people uncomfortable um, unless you do it for a living. Uh, so many people will accept the first offer that they are given without even countering. Um, and it can be very scary to get to an offer stage of a job that you really, really want and you fear that you're going to lose it um, just by asking for more money. Uh, but don't be fearful because if you approach the salary negotiations correctly, it's one of the fastest, most efficient ways to boost your income. Um, just know that your job offer will not be revoked during a salary negotiation as long as you remain realistic, polite, and respectful. Um, and do keep in mind that employee, employers generally expect some negotiation in the hiring process, and they've already built that into the offer by initially pitching a number that's lower than they can ultimately go. So reflecting back in that last slide, we had touched about knowing your worth, um, and this is a very important thing. Um, so remember when you go about when, to remember when you go about negotiating your salary, you want to arm yourself with market data on average salaries for your position. You want to factor in your own level of experience and unique attributes that you bring to the table. It's even possible that as a highly valued candidate, you can even command more than the market average. Um, and finally, you want to build in some small cushion of cash that goes slightly above the actual number you want so that if they offer less than, than you had asked for, you'd still be happy with the results. Um, okay, so when an offer comes in lower than what you were expecting, your response might sound something like this. Um, I'm very excited about the position, and I know I'd be the right fit for the team. I'm also excited about your offer, and I know that I'll bring a lot of value to the table based on my experience that we discussed during the interviews. I'm just wondering if we could explore a slightly higher number of fill in the blank. You might be super nervous delivering that message, but you'll want to stay upbeat and poised, and remember that the worst thing that could happen is they just say no. Um, and last on this matter, I just want to rein in. The main reason employees 
um, aren't paid what they feel like they're worth isn't because they don't deserve it, it's because they simply don't ask. So another thing kind of to keep in mind during the salary negotiations is that um, you may get the dreaded question about salary history, right? Everybody gets scared about that. They feel like they're going to get locked into something. Um, so where your previous salary can be a personal factor and what income range you're ideally trying to achieve, what you don't want is that future employer to use that to calculate your compensation. So if you are asked about salary history, you can respond with a phrase such as, you know, I choose to keep that information confidential, but I'm looking for compensation in the range of X to Y. Um, so lastly, I'm thinking of the overall offer being extended. Um, you want to consider non-salaried forms of compensation to negotiate. Uh, a lot of people forget about these things until after they accept the offer. Um, so while salary is important, um, you just don't want to lose sight of things that could add a lot of value and cost savings to your life and help increase an overall compensation package. Uh, for example, asking for an early salary review, such as like three months in, revisiting the salary and looking to increase um, your base um, based on performance. Um, remote work, flex time. Um, remote working opportunities can give you the opportunity to cut back on commuting costs, childcare expenses, maybe even housing fees. Um, asking for, for uh, professional development opportunities, uh, company phone, car, technical equipment, stipend, um, stock options, extra vacation time. These are all things to consider, especially if you aren't able to increase your salary that you're asking for, but you might be able to have some flexibility in non-salary uh, forms of compensation. Okay, so I know I feel like I went over that super, super quick, um, and there's a lot of content to digest, and it's easy for me to just probably sit here and give you a checklist and say, you got this, but um, I want you all to know just to feel free to reach out to me with any questions or advice or anything related to your job search, um, or if there's anything that we talked about today that intrigues you and that you want more information on, please, please reach out. I'm happy to help and would love to be a resource for you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank Thanks, Eden. Um, the next few slides are specifically uh, our names and contact information um, for the purpose of what Eden just said. Um, Eden, let me flip over to her. Eden is the local division director and um, has a team of recruiters and um, and account specialists underneath her that if you are looking really in this Washington area, um, she can support you. But even if you're looking for an international or excuse me, I should say, yeah, international too, but uh, global contact and would like to, to have further survey information, salary survey information, or career counseling, or resume writing counseling, uh, anything. We don't just uh, require that you're a registered candidate with us. We like to see ourselves as the subject matter expert in our market and want you to know that we're there um, to, to help you even if you're not going to need our services as an employer. Um, my contact, if I, if I flip back real quick, my contact information is similar to hers in that I primarily sit in the Seattle office, but I travel a lot. So if you wanted to reach out to me in particular, uh, my cell phone is listed here, and that's definitely the best way to get to me. And then, of course, Bill, like we mentioned in the beginning, his um, email address is listed right here. He's on social media. Of course, he's on LinkedIn um, in, in, in addition. So please do not hesitate. We have about 11, 12 minutes to answer questions and answers. Um, I know during the process, during the conversation, today we did have some chat questions come through. I'm going to pass this back off to, to Sam to kind of facilitate that and monitor it. But let me just say right off the bat, I saw some of the questions come through, and um, I'm going to have to defer to Bill <laughs> on many of them because there's some really tech there's some really technical questions in here that I I for sure could uh, I could address, but I do not think I'd have the strongest answer. So Eden and I are happy to answer um, any questions that you have about job search needs and and broad supply chain logistics transportation questions, but the really detailed one, Bill, I am going to definitely only have to lean on, on you for. So Sam, I'll let you go from here. Sure. Uh, thank you, Linnell, and thank you, Eden, uh, for that very informative presentation. And I will jump right into these questions. I don't want to leave one out. And even if we do, after the presentation, we will get in contact with you with a sufficient answer. So Bill, I think this is for you. Are there any uh, supply chain and logistics industry certifications similar to, like, if you're an accountant, you have the CPA or a CMA? So are there any certifications that people should pursue or look into if they're in the field? 
Sure. There are several certifications out there. Um, the three different groups, uh, APEX, which you may be familiar with, the Association for Ops Management, uh, ISM, which is the Institute for Supply Management, and CSCMT, uh, which is the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. All of those have different certifications. APEX has several um, that, you know, you can demonstrate a you know, a specialty in some particular area of supply chain. Uh, that being said, I have never seen anybody get a job based on the fact that they have a certificate. Um, you know, sometimes it's sort of a nice to have type of thing. I think for the most part, you know, it, it, this isn't a surprise to anybody, the way people get jobs is through other people, whether it's through the, the folks here at Agilon who are plugged into a lot of opportunities or through building a network like we try to do with the, with the program with our alums and, and board members. So, um, yeah, that, that, would be, uh, that would be my answer to that one. Okay, great. Um, I'll direct this one to Linnell and Eden. Um, Linnell and Eden, what kind of soft skills have you seen in some of your recruits and some of the clients with whom you work to fill positions in the supply chain and logistics area? What kind of soft skills transfer or translate uh, very well into the supply chain logistics field? Like what should candidates have if they're deciding mm -hmm. to pursue this career? Absolutely, love that question. So first and foremost, you, um, you know, back in the day, having really strong communication and presentation skills may not have been as important. And when I say presentation skills, I'm speaking about the ability to work with Adobe, PowerPoint, um, the analytics part of the conversation we had about are they able to uh, show graphs and charts, but also more importantly, how they are able to communicate verbally and in written email to members of their team um, that that are in super, you know, senior level management, mid level management, and uh, maybe perhaps underneath them as well. There, I would, I would, I would venture to say that about 65% of our clients have stated to us in their job requisition opening that they are, they will put a heavier emphasis on strong communication and confidence presentation skills over the technical side. If there is a degree involved but no experience, the client is willing to teach the, the experience, um, especially since they're going to be able to teach them the, the right way, which is the, the way that that company works. And then they won't have to worry about the cultural um, fit of someone who might have a fear of communicating, who may not have written uh, ex, um, abilities, and also, again, those technical skills of Adobe, PowerPoint, so on and so forth. Okay, great. Um, and Bill, this might be for you. I know we say supply chain logistics almost like one run-on sentence, and we probably use the terms interchangeably. And I know that's probably a mistake because I know there are some differentiations between supply chain logistics and also purchasing and procurement. So, Bill, can you give kind of a quick breakdown of the compare and contrast those aspects and how they relate? Sure, sure. So, supply chain is this enormous discipline that comes all the way from, if you think about maybe building a bicycle, right? So, the time that the steel ore comes out of the ground, all the way till the very end where you say, I don't like this bicycle and I'm going to return it to the merchant. Um, so, all the manufacturing, all the procurement, everything, all the logistics, everything that goes on in between. And for those of you, there's a model called the SCORE model that breaks down the supply chain into specific uh, areas of activity. There's like plan, source, make, deliver, return, enable. And in each one of those, there are very large categories of activity. So purchase would be in one of them. Logistics is in deliver. Uh, IT systems are in enable. So the supply chain is this sort of complex end-to-end you know, in endeavor, and what we try to do is enable you to understand, you know, inventory, logistics, IT systems, finance, how all those things play into the operation of a, uh, an efficient supply chain. Okay, perfect. And I know we mentioned a lot of kind of the big players, the big companies, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, the Amazons, your Boeings, your Microsofts. But I know there's got to be other opportunities for maybe smaller, I don't want to say mom and pop, but kind of smaller to mid-sized companies. Um, Eden, uh, Linnell, any experience kind of getting your foot in the door with those kind of companies before you might make the move to the likes of a Microsoft or an Amazon? 
Certainly. I think any of the, if you're coming, you know, directly out of school and, and just maybe a, a year experience or even maybe an internship, um, you are probably going to start out mostly in the production type, um, supply chain and logistics tr or transportation positions. Um, unless you have gone on and got, you've obtained your master's degree and or had some sort of um, a dual degree or emphasis in technology, and again, analytics, I just keep beating that down, uh, but if you've had a, techni a te technology emphasis in addition to your supply chain degree and, and master's program, then you might be able to move into, right off the bat, into a smaller or medium-sized company into more of a, a ma management level role. Um, because of your expertise, I, if I were to if I were to venture down all the titles that I would say are probably um, most needed and most used in a small to medium sized company, I'd be here for quite a while. But what I can say is, in our salary survey, that is defined, um, and we can provide anyone who needs it a list of jobs that are more frequently um, needed and used in a small company medium company and large company and we do have we do break down titles and really org charts to be honest with you we can break down an org chart on what a org chart for us supply chain logistics org chart might look like for a small company versus medium or, or large so if someone wanted really in-depth detail and more information here if they just wanted to chat their email address um, on here we can get back to them on that and must still have okay. anything to add there Yes, Sam, I could just uh, chime in with one thing. I think as you're looking for a career or looking to advance your career, it's a pretty significant choice whether you go with a small to medium-sized company or if you go with a giant company like Microsoft or Boeing. We have students who do yeah. both. Um, you know, at Boeing, you may be highly specialized in one, you know, sort of relationship management with a specific supplier for a specific set of SKUs, um, which is a really, really, you're really down in the weeds. It's not bad, you're, you know, but you're very focused on one very specific activity. At smaller, medium companies, we have students who are in our program, some of whom are essentially acting as supply chain managers kind of end to end. The companies are smaller, they have fewer suppliers, they don't make as many products and so you know in making decisions about inventory or whatever it may be if you're at a smaller or medium-sized company you may find that you learn more about the end-to-end -end. Uh, this is very much of a, an individual decision there are things to recommend both approaches okay perfect um, we had a one of our participants George Lehman uh, he asked some of that salary survey or is there any way to access or drill down to some of the local market data at that, or yes. should we? There is, okay. Yes. So I would say, first and foremost, even though our salary survey is pretty darn good, my favorite site, if you want to drill down to the absolute most specific um, areas of, of maybe location, total compensation, benefits offered, all of those things, I would tell you to go to salary.com. It's just a website, www.salary.com, and it allows you to enter zip code and then, then even put in a certain mile radius that you're hoping to work within. Um, it lets you put in your level of experience and education and tenure in, in actually working in the corporate world. Um, it allows you to say that you would like to you prefer to work for a medium-sized company. Um, those sorts of things that let you drill down to really specific like is um, you know stock option and 401k important to you and then it provides you a report with based on your parameters of where you want to work what size company you want to work and your experience level what you should anticipate to be paid and what it'll also show you a certain number of people that are in the same boat as you and what they are currently getting paid so that's one of my favorite websites there are others that are that are that you have to pay for salary.com's um, for the most part free, so that's my favorite. Um, my last uh, answer would be if you were to engage a search firm like Agile, it doesn't have to be just us, although we'd prefer that, um, but if you were to engage a search firm out here in, uh, in any, any marketplace that you're looking at finding a job, and you were to ask them for a survey over the last uh, 12 months even, uh, how many purchasing agent positions have you seen and what was the, the average 
uh, pay rate for that and what was the average requirement or skill set that the client asked for, um, any firm should be willing to be able to give you that information as well. I hope that answers that. Oh, of course. Um, I think we'll do one more question since we did start a couple minutes after, so we'll get our full hour in. Uh, let's say um, uh, Rohan, one of our participants, he, he's thinking about supply chain analysts. Any kind of prerequisites or skills or kind of educational requirements you would say for supply chain analysts? Can anybody answer that off the top of their head? Uh, this, is, this is Bill. I think it very much depends. Supply chain analysts can mean so many different things. It really depends on, you know, what supply chain you're analyzing, what your responsibilities are. It can be a more senior role. It can be a more junior role. So I think it, it really depends on the scope of responsibility. Okay. Okay, and we'll do one final question. Are there any uh, publications or blogs or academic journals you would recommend to people within the industry that they should subscribe to a, an email newsletter at, at the very least or kind of keep up on in order to stay abreast of industry developments? Um, well, the Supply Chain Management Review is a really great publication that's read by most senior executives. It has some relatively technical, not, not like academic and pages of calculus type of technical, but it has some sort of technical uh, case studies about different problems within supply chain. So that might be a good thing to, uh, to take a look at. There are tons of publications out there that are about inbound logistics is one. Um, you know, there are many, many, many publications out there, some of which you can get for free if you just sort of sign up. So if you did a search of supply chain publications, you'd find an enormous number of things. It does partly depend on your area of interest. Yeah, I would okay, add great. that, and I agree. I would agree with Bill yeah, at the end. It, it kind of varies on um, your area of interest, but if you just simply go into Google and type in supply chain blogs or supply chain um, podcasts, you would be surprised at how many things come up. Uh, right off the bat in the first page, there will be like 10, um, 10 articles that will say the top 10 best informative blogs for supply chain in 2017, or it will say the must-hear podcast um, of 2017 around logistics. If you just Google that, you know, whatever specific title um, or area of expertise you're trying to get into, and you add blogs and or podcasts, tons and tons of forums come up. Okay, perfect. Well, I think with that, we'll wrap this up. Um, so much great information. I want to thank uh, Bill and the University of Washington's master's program for contributing so much, and of course to Linnell and Eden, my fellow uh, presenters today, for their great insight. And thanks to all the participants who submitted questions and joined us, and we hope you got a lot out of it. And again, this will be posted on our site, and we will follow up so you can rewatch if you need to to get some specific details. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sam, for having us. Thank you, Bill, for inviting us and allowing us to do this. Hope we can do it uh, together soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. Thanks, Bill. Have a great day. See you. Bye.